Hello again, everyone. I'm hoping that you had an opportunity to view the video that I posted on this in this week's learning unit uh, regarding the Great Depression. This is a, a PBS, a, a part of a PBS series on the Great Depression that was um, on, uh, aired probably some you know 15 years ago or so. There's some great clips about uh, film clips about what was going on during that period of time. It is a documentary. If you haven't seen it, I think it's you know about 45 or 50 minutes long. And uh, while it seems to be kind of slow at some points, it gives you a really good taste and flavor for what was going on at the time um, as this. Uh, as this learning unit gets underway in our history, it was really a very grave economic times. Our current economic situation has uh, been been very troubling, and and uh, certainly in comparison to uh, the times that um, that we're going to be studying here in this learning unit, uh, we're probably much better off than we were back then. Part of the reason that we probably are doing better now is because of some of the programs that were implemented in that day and age, um, although many of the uh, uh, right-wing politicians in, in our current uh, in our current political landscape really vilify the, the New Deal that emerged from the Great Depression. Um, the New Deal was certainly uh, the most uh, important so piece of social legislation in our history uh, and redefined the way federal government deals with social needs of its citizens. But uh, we'll be talking more about that as we go along in this learning unit. At the beginning of this time period, uh, Herbert Hoover had just been elected president uh, in 1928. And uh, while I believe at that time history would tell you that there were some signs of economic instability, some concerns about credit, um, and those kinds of things, nonetheless, um, we were coming out of an era in the 1920s of, of a good deal of economic prosperity. And, and in fact, in his inaugural address, Herbert Hoover was, was uh, very uh, enthusiastic in saying that prosperity was just around the corner. Hoover, uh, just as an aside, had a, an interesting history himself. As, uh, um, History books show him as being an effective president, and um, also somebody who was very conservative. Uh, was was a member of the Republican Party. In fact, um, during I believe he was a member of the cabinet during the um, um, Wilson administration. At least uh, Woodrow Wilson, um, who was a Democrat, he became very Hoover became very well known after World War One for a lot of his efforts in. Uh, um, trying to help restore Europe, I believe, and um, was known before that time as well for a lot of his economic efforts, and so he was really, con or a lot of his uh, social efforts around Europe, um, and, and he was really uh, quite respected and uh, looked to as a humanitarian, in fact, uh, in the 1920s, uh, world famous, in fact, for, for much of his efforts uh, around the world, not only in Europe, but in Asia as well. Um, he was an engineer by trade, as I recall. And so when he was elected president in, in 1928, um, uh, I think there was some good, um, some positive feelings about him and some and great hope for the future. Um, in his inaugural address, he said that um, he believed that the United States was approaching a triumph over poverty. And so the times were looking pretty bright. Uh, but by the end of that year, in October 1929, the the um, uh, what we studied as the most famous uh, crash of the stock market at least and it shattered a lot of the economic stability of the era. Um, the credit structure was uh, nearing collapse. Unemployment had increased a great deal, and and because of that, sales had fallen off, income falling, and production thus began to decrease, and it began this spiral of of uh, increased unemployment and f further falling sales and more decreases in production um, as the as the private market system kind of responded to those economic pressures without any intervention by the government at all. Un uh, some indications of, of just how severe things got. At 1929, uh, at the start of the Hoover administration, our unemployment rate was at 3.2 percent. That really is full employment, perhaps even a little above full employment if if we believe what our, our um, Studies tell us at least, you know, that a 5% unemployment rate is probably optimal as far as uh, wages and and prices and things like that. But uh, unemployment was even better than those days. Uh, 
By the end of Hoover's administration in 1933, Unemployment had reached uh, the figure of 25%. Now, compare that to today, where you see which we're under 9%, and, and we really believe, we see that unemployment is, or we have been at least under 9%, and, and that un, the um, concern about un, unemployment is very grave in, in the current economy. So you can see how desperate things were in 1933. Um, this you have to also consider that the 25% unemployment doesn't mean that three out of four people aren't working, it, or, or, or only three out of four people are working, it, or one out of four people are not working. I suppose what it means is one out of four people who are trying, actively trying to seek work, are not getting work. That's a big difference. These are people who are in the job market, who want to have a job, who are used to having work, who can't get. Uh, job. One out of four workers in those days were in that position. In addition to that, and, and I don't have the, the statistic in terms of what percentage, but a large number of individuals who were not counted in these statistics were people who were, who were working at part-time jobs uh, who were what we would call underemployed. And so the situation was very grave in those days. It's also interesting to note that uh, by 1943, which was halfway through the Second World War, our unemployment rate had fallen to 1.2 percent. A very dramatic change uh, during those years. Some people believe that the New Deal programs had a lot to do with that. Uh, others will tell you the war had a lot to do with it, reducing the unemployment rate. But this kind of shows you how how employment really fluctuated a, a great deal during those uh, 15 or 20 years that we're studying today. The Great Depression really forced the nation to recognize that poverty and unemployment could be the result of, of a malfunctioning of our society. People who had worked all their lives, people who had accumulated um, uh, a fair amount of capital, were, were um, standing in bread, bread lines. And uh, there are stories of people committing suicide because of all the things they lost during this era. Um, certainly did open the eyes of a lot of people to recognize that there can be times when even the most uh, independent and hardworking individual can fall upon hard times uh, and not be able to take care of himself or herself. And so the Great Depression really, I believe, kind of forced the nation to confront the fact that poverty isn't necessarily just the result of individual, um, individual failures. With the economic depression that was going on, uh, in addition to this, uh, throughout the South, which was a largely still a, a largely agricultural uh, economy, uh, there was a drought, uh, a very severe drought that w that lasted for quite a length of time. Uh, and this again is depicted in the video uh, that that you watched. So a lot of people moved to the cities, and so that only increases the pressure upon the employment market in the cities, and unemployment goes up um, in, in those population centers. So there's a fair amount of social unrest uh, going on during this period of time. You're beginning to see some strikes and, and uh, demonstrations, uh, even some riots at different times. Uh, and so the, the uh, times were becoming very uh, concerning. And again, in in your uh, the video that you that you hopefully saw, you saw the Bonus Army march on uh, uh, Washington in 1932. Uh, this is something we really don't much study about in our American history books. And if you've seen the video, you understand why. If not, please do watch the video, and and uh, you'll see a time in our history that, uh, well, we we just kind of like to not talk about too much. So. Herbert Hoover's response to this, and, and uh, the stock market crash was early in his administration, uh, and the drought developed, I believe, uh, around the same time, and so H Hoover had a lot in his hands. And uh, Hoover himself was a Quaker, and, and, and um, was a, a very peace-loving individual who also believed a lot in individual effort, and, and believed that people should take care of themselves. And so with this personal philosophy that he had, he did very little to address the social welfare needs that uh, were coming to him because of the the uh, economic problems of his time. He he believed very much in a balanced federal budget. He believed in laissez-faire capitalism. That is, um, that uh, the government should not intervene in the economic system. That the system should be allowed to correct itself as necessary. And he also believed in states' rights. And so he was not prone to um, to involve the federal government in correcting the issues. He wasn't he wasn't given to doing that. 
But finally, uh, as things continued to worsen, uh, um, Hoover's administration implemented what was called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, and this was really during the last year of his administration. Um, and, and the RFC provided for emergency financing for agriculture, commerce, and industry. Um, you'll notice here that what is absent is any direct relief for, for individuals. This was not something that he believed the government should be involved in. So those needs of individuals and families were left to um, uh, local and state governments and private charities. Roosevelt, or, I mean, sorry, Hoover in particular was, um, uh, in fact, I think he was sort of considered the uh, the patron saint of, of of the American Red Cross, and he he encouraged volunteer efforts in in relieving the human, uh, the, the individual human problems that were arising because of this. And he he believed that if the government was going to intervene, it should be on more of that that macro level. So the video I'm referring to is a, uh, a video segment from PBS's The Great Depression, and the particular um, segment of that uh, that I'd like you to watch is The Road to Rock Bottom, and uh, this web uh, address will be is placed in in the um, um, the learning unit for the week, and so uh, I encourage you to watch this. It's um, again, it's about 45 minutes long, and it's uh, it's um, a gives you a, a really good illustration of, of the times. So Herbert Hoover's economic philosophies, or the philosophies at least of his administration, were what we call supply-side economics. In um, Hoover's belief was, is, uh, or the belief at least of the of those who uh, ascribe to this theory, is that we, if you put the resources, and in this case we're talking, you know, federal money and, and those kinds of things, if you put resources in the hands of the producers that is the capitalists, the owners, then industry would revive because the the uh, owners could invest those those resources into their into their industry, into their business, create new jobs and as new jobs were created then unemployment would be reduced, people would have more money, could purchase more goods which would cause further production which would mean more jobs. You see how it goes from there. Um, and this, this essentially says that if you, you know, if you provide the resources to the people in the upper echelons of, of the economic society, uh, that you're going to get a better return for your money because they'll invest it in, in the economy. Uh, and that the benefits then from doing that will trickle down to the, the, the consumer, to the people at the lower end of the economic ladder. Uh, and that's why we call supply-side economics trickle-down theory. This is something that uh, is it, a very popular uh, economic theory, in fact, and, and it's one that tends to be associated more with the economic policies of the Republican Party throughout our, at least throughout the 20th century history up to the current day. Um, Roosevelt, on the other hand, uh, R Franklin Roosevelt, not Teddy. Franklin Roosevelt was Teddy Roosevelt's, uh, I believe, his second cousin, if I remember correctly. In fact, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, if, if I remember my history correctly, actually um, walked Eleanor Roosevelt, Franklin's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, walked her down the aisle and gave her away at, at their wedding, Franklin and Eleanor's wedding. So just a little bit of family history there for you. The Roosevelts uh, were, were qu quite uh, entwined in our government for a period of time in leading our government. Franklin Roosevelt, um, unlike Herbert Hoover, who had come from a very, uh, I believe, um, very simple kind of a background, Franklin Roosevelt was born into wealth and was uh, a patrician throughout his life. He had, um, like his uncle, or like his second cousin, Teddy Roosevelt, before he became president, he was uh, an undersecretary of the Navy, I believe, in the, in the Wilson administration uh, during the, the First World War. And in fact, an interesting um, side note in history here is, is that during the, I think it was the 1920 campaign, uh, there was some talk of a Roosevelt-Hoover ticket uh, that they thought that at the time that Hoover might come, Hoover wasn't really associated with either party early on in, in this period of time, and, and a lot of people thought they could get Hoover over to the Democratic Party. And again, he was popular enough that everybody wanted him. And... Uh, Roosevelt and Hoover, who ran against each other in 1932 in this rather famous election that 
change the tide and course of history were friends and and it actually talked about or had, there had been some talk about them running together in the, on the ticket in 1920 but that didn't happen and as i say you know history moves forward and in 1932 uh, herbert hoover's um, popularity was so low that he was very handily defeated by franklin roosevelt in, in this election and turned out of office Roosevelt, um, despite the fact that he came from a very uh, wealthy family, um, had uh, intentions to try to uh, address the issues of the of the um, individuals as well as the, uh, the the government needing to step in and, and deal with industry. had a had a much different kind of perspective on things, and and his his uh, administration's approach is what we call demand side economics. Um, or Keynesian um, uh, Keynesian theory is I think John Maynard Keynes is the name of the individual who kind of developed this particular theory. Now, just a little bit of economics 101. Um, you understand supply side economics. The supply side piece is the producers, right? They're the people who supply the goods. Demand side are the consumers. These are the people who demand the goods, who want to purchase the goods. So that's you get the picture of where then um, the resources enter the picture. You know, depending upon which which one you're looking at. So in demand side economics, um, the the philosophy is that the consumer should be provided with the resources that enables them to create the demand, and that industry will then respond to that demand by producing more goods, creating more jobs those kinds of things and the economy would grow that way so really the difference in these two economic theories is is where the money goes from if if it's the government so roosevelt's response well he he, he defeated herbert hoover in 1932 and while he continued to keep focus on supporting and developing the free market economy um, his uh, party really presented a platform that began to address individual and family needs. So this is a reflects that demand side philosophy of his administration. And he proposed in his, um, I think is actually during his campaign, he proposed a new deal for the American nation. Uh, and, and his programs became called the New Deal as a result of that. Um, so in 1933, his first year in office, well, this is only a couple of things that he did actually he did a number of different things uh, I believe when he first became president one of the things he did was he closed the banks he actually shut the banks down for um, uh, a period of time and I forget how long it is how long it was but it was the intent of it was to uh, calm everybody down because people were actually pulling all their money out of the banks uh, because they were afraid that um, they'd lose their money if they didn't and of course if there isn't money in the banking system if if we're not putting our money in in the banking system the banking system is in grave trouble as well because there's no money there then to loan to people to you know start business and those kinds of things and so um he he had to stabilize the um uh financial picture and in one way he did that was by closing the banks for a period of time just to get everybody to calm down but uh, as far as programming goes, his administration established two different programs, uh, the Federal Emergency Relief Act, FERA, which was intended to provide direct relief to individuals. Now, this is a big change from the, from the Hoover administration. Here, we are looking at a program that was going to provide direct relief to individual peoples, with uh, individual individuals with need. Uh, the other, the National Industrial Recovery Act, was intended... Um, hmm, to produce uh, to introduce federal control of work sites um, and uh, in, again a lot of this had to do with uh, ensuring that uh, workers were not exploited um, and that um, uh, work sites were reasonable places for people to live and there were a number of different reasons for that that involved uh, opening up jobs for individuals um, and, and so on we'll be touching on that more as as this learning unit goes on now, keep in mind, FIRA and NERA were the first two big economic interventions as far as the Roosevelt administration was concerned. Um, and the intent was uh, of the New Deal. Well, they were referred to by historians, at least, as the three R's. Relief, recovery, and reform. Relief for the unemployed and the poor. Uh, recovery of the economy to normal levels. And the reform of the financial system to prevent a repeat depression. Uh, the Supreme Court uh, 
and this is a Supreme Court that was in place after uh, 12 years, I believe, of uh, Republican uh, leadership. And in fact, um, since the turn of the century, I believe, let's see, the uh, yes, until the time of Roosevelt's election in 1932, um, the White House uh, w was uh, occupied by Republican for the entire time, except for the eight years of the Wilson administration. And so the reason I say that is, is because um, the likelihood would be that you would have more conservative Supreme Court justices appointed by those presidents. And Supreme Court justices get those jobs for life when they're appointed. They stay there until they, well, they die or retire at least. And, and, um, and so um, that's really something that I believe is one of the most important things that um, a president does is is uh, is appointing Supreme Court justices because this leaves the imprint of that president on the history of America for many years long after the end of the president's administration. And so Roosevelt uh, comes to power after many years of conservative uh, leadership and, and uh, has to deal with a conservative Supreme Court who which declared both Fira and Nira unconstitutional. And so it was necessary, even though these were uh, important programs, it was necessary for the federal government and Roosevelt administration to go back and rework these programs to kind of fit more of the guidelines that the, the Supreme Court was looking for. And so um, uh, FIRA developed into eventually into the Social Security Act of 1935 and the National Industrial Recovery Act uh, evolved into what was called the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. More on these uh, ahead. So after Congress dumped Roosevelt's New Deal, he sort of came up with what, what we think of as the second New Deal, but we just call this the New Deal. And these are really the things that um, history records as being some of the most important uh, uh, interventions by the federal government in some time. Um, and, and if you look at this, uh, you'll see, well, let me just let me just go through this list a little bit. Uh, the Homeowners Loan Corporation uh, provided funds for the repair, refinancing, and, and purchases of new mortgages and homes. And so uh, the federal government established a, a corporation to provide loans to, to individuals to keep their homes up to par. The Agricultural Adjustment Act, uh, that's the AAA, no relation to the American Automobile Association, by the way. Um, AAA uh, paid farmers to limit production in their fields and also uh, work to distribute surplus foods to the needy individuals so that farm prices can be stabilized. If farmers produce too much food and uh, the better they get at, you know, uh, fertilizing and, and uh, the more they learn about and through science about growing and, you know, producing the... Uh, uh, food most the most efficient way of producing foods and things like this the more food we're going to have right but if too much food gets gets out on the market food prices are going to fall that's what happens with the supply and demand uh, theory you know so so um, uh, at this time one of the ways to help the the farmer out the federal government actually paid farmers to leave their fields um, what we call fallow, where they weren't where they weren't producing any food at all, so that the um, prices of food could could remain stable. And at the same time, when there was surplus foods, um, the government uh, author or uh, managed the distribution of those foods um, to to needy individuals. That particular, um, I mean, and, and it's an entirely different program. But when we talk about the food stamp program today. Uh, they're not really stamps. I don't know that they ever were stamps, but uh, but in any event, that's a program of the D uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. It's not a it's not a health and social services program. And the intent of that is, among other things, is to uh, is to uh, distribute that. Uh, well, to make sure that the the uh, farmers continue to have a market out there, and so they put uh, money in the hands of needy individuals, so that food uh, they assure that food's purchased, and this is much for the farmers as it is for the people who are using the food stamps. But in any event, uh, that that is not uh, an outgrowth of the AAA, but it's a much similar philosophy. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC, insured deposits made in banks. So this this aided in in uh, helping people to have more confidence in the banking system, and and uh, that if they left their money there, which is what you know, as we mentioned earlier, was very important for them to do, uh, that they knew the government would would uh, 
would insure their their savings up to a certain point and i don't know the the uh, the well, the FDIC is still there, and when you go to your banking window, uh, a lot of times next to the teller you'll see a little insignia that says that, that your deposits are, de are insured by the FDIC. It's still in place. Um, the limits on how much they insure has gone up qu quite dramatically, and rest assured that um, the, the average American doesn't have to worry about having more money in his banking account than the FDIC will insure. And if you have that much money, I'd say spread it out among some other banks. Or invest it you know um, the national youth authority nya their job pr provided jobs for young americans in school and college um, establishing a record uh, uh, a history uh, and getting experiences work uh, in those young years is very very important and so nya uh, helped young people get on their feet in the in the in the labor market the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, employed men 18 to 25 years of age. Yes, men 18 to 25 years of age were employed in conservation activities around the nation. I believe the CCC helped to establish some of our federal parks, or national parks, uh, and, and did a lot, a lot of other projects around uh, that, um, many of which uh, remain, in fact. Uh, the CCC was one of those things that uh, a lot of people look upon fondly from the New Deal. The WPA, the Works Progress Administration, provided funding to uh, individuals who were skilled or educated um, to be employed in various projects. And um, I, you know, I, I for instance, I um, I went to uh, did my undergraduate work in Michigan State. It's a large um, state university in Michigan, a very large campus, and. Um, in the old section of the campus, uh, or in the Circle Drive, I think we call it, you know, there are a lot of these old buildings that, uh, well, they're built with the gargoyles and <clears throat> all sorts of things above the doorways, as I recall, and little spires on the top of the buildings, and they are brick and mortar and concrete block and as solid as they come. And these are some buildings that were built during the WPA, and you see these, just these wonderfully stable structures that were built uh, from this period of time the government was were was funding this construction uh, the, the government uh, paid um, engineers and architects and workers to to actually build these buildings and so uh, the WPA buildings that still exist today uh, really are, are monuments to the to this particular program other kinds of things uh, for instance uh, artists were were commissioned to uh, paint murals and you know public places and, and you know those kinds of things I guess to create sculptures and I would bet you that WPA funded music and all sorts of things it was really a uh, uh, a very creative way, and you understand what's happening here is is that with the CCC and the NYA and uh, the WPA, you know, the government has become an employer, essentially, not just federal employees, but I mean, is sort of the the funding source of last resort for employment and uh, uh, through this program, and it really did get America working again, apparently, and and help to uh, stabilize things. It, so. Another part of the New Deal was the Social Security Act of 1935 provided direct benefits to workers and families, and uh, we'll be talking about that in a few moments more. The, the, the SSA, or the Social Security Act was probably, you know, the centerpiece, uh, at least as we look upon it historically, it was one of the, the centerpiece of the New Deal. Other pieces of the New Deal include the National Labor Relations Act, or the Wagner Act, which uh, established that workers have a right to collective bargaining. Unions, uh, the unions are still very active, and this is something that was very important to them. Workers' compensation was also becoming established uh, through through the states, and workers' compensation again this is a payment from from your employer through an insurance program if you're injured on the job, something that Yurgis would have benefited from greatly. Uh, and the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938 provided for such things as, well, a 44-hour work week, um, and that if you worked more than that period of time, you were paid overtime. Um, minimum wage was established for the first time, and child labor was finally outlawed. Um, the the importance of this, uh, this is some of this intervention into the uh, work site that I talked about earlier. For instance, in, in the 44-hour uh, work week and overtime, um, because employers have to pay time and a half for overtime over that 44 hours at the time it was 44 hours now it's 40 
um, employers it would encourage employers not to work one individual uh, too long because they have to pay them more if they work them overtime. And so uh, this encourages the employers to create more jobs so that they can get that work done maybe by more people, but at a lower rate. And so you see where the whole notion of overtime is something that, again, is, is sort of employment policy that, that helps to create jobs. Um, so the, the support that was enacted for the social insurance program during this period of time um, base, was based upon evidence of those people who were studying it at the time that poverty was structural rather than personal. I also think that uh, it had less to do with the research that was going on at the time and more to do with the fact that uh, people who had never been affected by um, by the economy before were gravely affected by it. And, and so when it hits the people who are in control in their pocketbooks, or at least it comes close to them, closer to them. People, the our our uh, leaders, our our uh, our our power elite will wake up and recognize the need to change things. Then, if it's getting close to affecting them, um, so. And and when we talk about Social Security Administration, also or the Social Security Act, I should say, I also want to add uh, a little side note there that the the original package had uh, universal health insurance in it, but uh, it was taken out of the original package and dropped because of protests of the American Medical Association. Um, later on, we'll be talking a little bit about the Clinton administration, and that's something that happened during during the early years of the Clinton administration when they uh, tried to enact a universal health care at that time as well. Um, as you know, from um, if you're paying attention to the to current events, you know uh, what's well, referred to as Obamacare now, which is a national health insurance program. At least the start of a national health insurance program um, is is, an, is still another attempt to um, to provide health care to all citizens in the United States. Um, and and really, you know, the uh, liberals and and the left wingers, I suppose, in in uh, today's uh, politics, you know, are very disappointed with with Obama's program because it doesn't it doesn't ensure universal coverage. It, it still leaves an, uh, millions of people uninsured. Um, meanwhile, the right wingers are opposed to it because of all the the role the government has in in the requirement that uh, individuals do have a uh, insurance program when they're able. Those kinds of things. So. Um, for some reason, um, healthcare is is uh, this one of the last areas that uh, we have in this nation to ensure the uh, well-being of individuals, and and uh, we there's just uh, such resistance to it, and uh, it's uh, well, there's all sorts of theories about why that would be. So the three primary parts of the Social Security Act as it was enacted in 1935, and that is the first one, the Federal Social Insurance for Workers. workers. Secondly, the Federal to State Categorical Assistance, and um, Maternal and Child Welfare was the third. Now, the middle one, Federal to State Categorical Assistance, is if you look at what that says, that explains what it is. Uh, this is the federal government providing money to the states, that's the federal to state piece, federal money going to the states to provide assistance for individuals in certain categories of need. That's just what, it, what it's telling you. So first let's look at, at uh, section one, the federal social insurance for workers. Um, this is what we typically refer to as social security today. And some some of your pay stubs may still have um, the um, initials O A S D I um, to um, to uh, signify your Social Security deduction. Um, I see. I just noticed here that there's a misspelling here. It should be insurance, as I'm sure you understand. But um, anyway, O A S D I. If you look at old age survivors, O A S. -D -I. D disability is is down below OASDI insurance, so that's that's what those initials stand for. In case you've ever wondered why they call Social Security that on your pay stub. So the different parts of this is first of all insurance for workers. Now these are this is uh, insurance for people who have worked. Now there wasn't a Social Security fund, uh, there wasn't a Social Security tax before this, but nowadays this is the fund that is your retirement fund basically through Social Security. 
so that when you become old enough, you retire and can draw employ uh, and uh, draw a check and Social Security. And uh, I know what's going through the heads of most of you younger individuals that, uh, in particular, that you know Social Security won't even be around when it comes time for you to retire. And I would just say to you, um, well, I'm I'm uh, much more optimistic than that. I think that uh, Social Security is a political football. The federal government, while um, you know expressing a lot of concern uh, at different times in different administrations about whether or not we can sustain the the uh, funding necessary to keep Social Security alive, you know, through the next century, um, those kinds of things. Uh, the federal government keeps raiding the Social Security fund for other things. And the Social Security fund is supposed to be uh, reserved specifically. Your tax money going into that is supposed to be reserved specifically for that fund uh, and generating interest and all sorts of things. But the federal government, through many administrations, has borrowed, so to speak, from that fund. It's one of the reasons that, uh, as I understand it, it's one of the reasons why the fund has had some troubles f fiscally. Uh, look at the uh, the uh, uh, <clears throat> tax uh, relief that uh, was implemented during the first administ the uh, first few years of the Obama administration. Um, what uh, the way that the tax cut has been given to most of the workers is to reduce the amount of the contributions to the Social Security fund by two percent, while this tax cut is extended by Congress. And so, how? How serious can we be that the Social Security fund is in dire straits if, if uh, in order to uh, put some more money back in the pockets of workers, we cut their, their contributions to Social Security? It tells me that it can't be that bad. And so if, if Social Security itself isn't even there, some variation of this is likely to, to continue now because this is a part of what we expect of our government now. Um, and and I don't see that changing. This is one of these things that's sort of established now in our culture. The idea that workers who spend their entire life contributing to the system will have some financial security at the time that, that uh, they no longer work. And that was the intent of the Social Security Act. Old age assurance was to provide a, a, a stable retirement fund. Survivor's insurance was added in 1939. And take care of the widows and children of workers who have died. In 19, and, and again, you know, one of the things that reflects is the fact that, remember, in this, this era, wives weren't working as much as they are today. And so, uh, if you remember the widow's pension from, from uh, the progressive era, this is sort of picking up on that from there. Disability was added in 1956 if you become disabled and can no longer work and you pass certain medical examinations, then the Social Security Fund will pay a disability check to you. Social Security Disability. 65, Medicare was added. This was health insurance for uh, retirees and elderly individuals. Unemployment compensation was also another part of the Social Security Act. And it's something that continues today. It's provided for by a, well, in part by a tax that you pay, an employment tax that you, employment security. It's called ESC, I believe, on your paycheck. Um, so it's a tax you pay that uh, pays into an insurance fund if um, if you are laid off. Um, uh, you can you can apply for funds to help tie, uh, pull you through until you can get another job. The second part of the Social Security Act, federal to state categorical assistance. And again, this is money that the feds provide to the states. So each of the states had their own programs here, and the states could determine the amount of assistance provided. So there is a widely variant amount of money that was provided through these programs, depending upon what state you lived in. If you lived in the South, you didn't get much money. Uh, in these programs. If you lived in the Northeast, you got more than than uh, other states. And this was old age assistance, OAA, and aid to the blind. In 1950, aid to the permanently and totally disabled was added. So you see, I'm just breaking this out because not all of this was immediately enacted at the time that the act was first put in place. 
Medicaid, which is the health insurance for individuals who who are in uh, in these programs uh, that can't afford health insurance themselves, was added. And I'll talk about this next one in a moment. But OAA and Aid to the Blind, the disability insurance. You see, there's there's a similarity to the federal insurance programs for workers that we had just talked about previously here where you have old age survivors and disability. Kind of the same thing here. Um, there's no survivor's insurance in this, but um, the difference here is is that these are people who have not worked, who haven't contributed to the Social Security system, and so uh, they wouldn't fall into the category of insurance, the insurance program for workers that, that the Section 1 had. And so in this particular section then, this covers individuals who who have not been able to work at all or have not worked enough at least to contribute a significant amount to the system. These programs were federalized in 1974 under a program called the Supplemental Security Income. Um, uh, the idea was the feds noticed that individuals in some states were getting so little and others were getting more and uh, in order to provide some sort of guarantee to a absolute minimum level of income something that might be able to be lived upon um, the federal government was providing supplemental money to uh, to those individuals in those states that didn't get much and the supplemental security income eventually these programs uh, were federalized and, and um, well, they're now known as SSI. So SSI provides uh, income to individuals who don't have enough of a work history, but who have a disability, for instance. Now, you don't see old people um, on, on SSI anymore because, you know, most everybody, with, with rare exception, those individuals that never were able to work, but most everybody now has contributed to the Social Security system so that retirees are covered under the um, Social Security, the Title I, and not under this particular category. Another very important part of this uh, act in this section is the Aid to Dependent Children. This is, the, this is the program that we think of when we talk about welfare usually. Um, in 1950, the caretaker was added to the grant, so originally um, the intent of the ADC program was to provide funds so that uh, mothers could stay home and raise their children. This is a very different time, you know, that in the 1930s and our philosophies about what women did or should do. And particularly, mind you, in the era of the Great Depression, when we were trying to create jobs for adult men, because we believed that men were the primary wage earners of the home, um, one of the ways to do that is to get women out of the job market and so this this program would enable mothers to stay home to raise their children and uh, the original intent was for it not to be um, have the stigma associated with it but well as I think I mentioned later on originally this program was to be a part of the run by the uh, Children's Bureau and the federal government but as the as the uh, legislation developed, it got switched over to the Department of Labor, so the focus wasn't so much on the kids in the grant as it was a, on the unemployed parent, the woman who was at home. And so this is kind of where we, where our philosophies about uh, welfare recipients uh, begins. This idea that they're lazy and they're not working. Um, in 1962, the program was renamed Aid to Families with Dependent Children, or AFDC, reflecting the fact that the caretaker was added to the grant. Um, the caretaker being added to the grant, uh, you know, increased uh, welfare roles to some extent and, and created quite a backlash uh, among some of the conservatives in that in that period of time, uh, and began to turn the tide against uh, welfare recipients. The, the third section, maternal and child welfare, and and by the way, I'll just mention to you, uh, we're going to talk more about the. Uh, uh, number three here, excuse me, number three here, the aid to dependent children section. We're going to talk more about that as, uh, 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 as well, actually, when we when we cover the reading from the Karen Seacombe book, we'll be talking a little bit more about that today. Maternal and child welfare, the care of homeless, dependent, and neglected children, ultimately evolved into child protection uh, through state legislation. Um, 
crippled children's services and, and various health programs. So these are other pieces of the Social Security Act that addressed family and medical needs um, and, and so on. I suspect you'd find that uh, our public health departments have, have grow out of uh, this this legislation. Phyllis Day says that the Social Security Act is the single most important piece of social legislation in the history of the United States. But despite that, it still separated uh, the poor out into worthy and unworthy. Uh, there was really no intent. Uh, oh, there might have been some effort or intent at one point to to um, um, kind of reduce the stigma of, of being a recipient, but still some individuals, particularly the ADC recipients, uh, uh, those that are not working, were still considered to be unworthy poor. Um, efforts were still made to maintain a low-wage workforce, uh, which is another thing that contributes to poverty. Uh, the, our economic system kind of rests upon the need for a low-wage low wage workforce, and, and it certainly contributes to poverty. And work was seen as the centerpiece of a moral life. I'll talk a little bit about what happened with some of our groups during this era, for women in particular. Uh, it's an interesting kind of a thing. I, I had made reference to this earlier about the ADC program being intended to, to pay moms to stay home to take uh, take, take care of their children. Um, you you read about women in the workplace in, in jungle, you know, and, and Ona's uh, particular problems, and it was really a pretty hard time for women to be in the workforce, and, and uh, some of the progressive era reforms, you know, really kind of began to relieve some of the issues that women had in the workforce, but just got started on it. But as the Great Depression emerged, there was a need really to get uh, jobs, make jobs available for, for adult males, the heads of the households. And, and so uh, the child labor legislation, which was started in the progressive era, really was enacted and finalized in the New Deal. Uh, to where you know the, the very very tight restrictions on on uh, children working and who could work at what age and how many hours and where they could work those kinds of things. Also, uh, this was really during the during the um, progressive era. You know, compulsory education was also established. You know, the idea that children had to be in school until they were 16. Another way to get children out of the workforce. Looks like an enlightened kind of thing for society to do to make sure the kids are educated. But really, a lot of the motivation had to do with economics. And so we have children out of the workforce in school or very restricted if they are in the workforce. we got to get women out of the workforce as well. And so um, there are a lot of different things as during the Depression then uh, uh, that were intended to push women out of the workforce and to make it easier for them to stay home. But when the war occurred in the, the Second World War is what I'm talking about here, men were taken out of industry. Women were actively recruited to work in industry, and in fact, there were some push that if people didn't want to work, if women didn't want to work in industry, that they could be drafted like men, you know, they could be drafted into into working in the uh, uh, factories and things like that. That never really happened, but that was a proposal. Uh, you know, the, the image of Rosie the Riveter, you might have heard of that, that kind of grows out of these days. Um, after World War II, when the men came back and, and needed their jobs back, there was a lot of social pressure placed on women to return to the home. Uh, Freudian theory, really kind of the whole philosophy of Freudian theory, which is women that were out there competing uh, in the world, you know, for jobs and politics and things, had masculinity complexes, you know. A lot of that just kind of um, reinforced the notion that women should stay at home. Uh, working mothers were blamed for things like, uh, well, like delinquency and even schizophrenia at that time. There were a lot of different things, a lot of pressure put on women to stay in at home and in the kitchen. And so we needed them during the war, but then we didn't want them in the workforce after that. But, um, you know, um, you can't get them back on the farm now that they've seen Paris, as, as the old song goes, I think. Um, women, uh, you know, got a taste for what it was like to be out in the work world as a group during that period of time and recognized during the war that really they could function independently uh, economically if the, if our society or our culture would permit it because uh, of what their experience during the Second World War. And so, well, these were the early days of the uh, 
the women's movement um, and the, the kind of were forming during this period of time. African Americans um, had a similar experience as women during this period of time in that, that they also were uh, employed at higher rates during the war and experienced more equal treatment, uh, you know, like how we go, because we need them. Uh, and, and this really set the stage for the Civil Rights Movement, which was to come. There was an increase in, in black activism during this period of time through various organizations like the Urban League and the NAACP. But nonetheless, uh, you know, this population remained the last hired and first fired. Uh, even in war, they were they were maintained in segregated units. Um, Harry Truman, I believe, uh, integrated the units. We might touch on this in a future learning unit uh, in 1947, I believe, after the war. He integrated the units. And, you know, the interesting thing is, is the arguments against uh, integrating, racially integrating uh, fighting units in the Second World War is very similar to the arguments that we've had against uh, uh, gays in the military in the last 10 years. <clears throat> And, and the military uh, was integrating their units ahead of uh, the rest of society. And, and this is a theme that you'll see and that I'll mention from time to time is that the, if you want to see where the nation is going, kind of take a look at what the federal government's doing in terms of, or the, the military is doing in terms of uh, social activism, because that's probably where we're, we're going. They, they integrated, racially integrated the units before the rest of the nation was doing integration in the South at least. Um, they were, uh, you know, women have become more actively involved in the military as have women, uh, before women were more actively involved in the, in the, um, labor force and, and, uh, now as, uh, gays are, you know, being more accepted in the military, um, at least officially speaking, um, and we're beginning to see legislation around the United States that uh, you know is is um, altering our perceptions of what of of what uh, uh, same-sex individuals uh, marriages, for instance, same-sex marriages, whether they should be permitted or not. And so, the military, in many respects, unexpectedly, perhaps you know you wouldn't think of this, but there really is sort of a cutting-edge institution as far as social issues are concerned. But in any event, despite that, you know, we, uh, some of the black veterans were, were finding themselves being lynched, especially in the South, upon return from war for a variety of different reasons that, uh, you know, well, in any event, the federal government didn't respond to this until well into the 1950s. There were some uh, programs for the veterans returning from the Second World War to help ease them back into the uh, into the system. The Servicemen's Readjustment Act, or we call it the GI Bill, was implemented in 1944. It provided stipends for school, uh, going to school, or to build a home, uh, to start a business, uh, to, you know, provided loans for farms. Uh, also provided some unemployment, uh, additional unemployment insurance for veterans, knowing that, uh, you know, there was a readjustment and also they needed time to find work. Uh, so the the uh, and I have read that African Americans, while while they were, uh, in some respects, the GI Bill helped uh, um, sort of seed uh, the African American, a black middle class, uh, because of the of the uh, opportunities that they got when they came back from the Second World War. Um, if you do more reading, you'll also find out that. Um, uh, African Americans did not benefit to the same level that uh, that whites did in, in in this program, and so that's something for more research for you if you're interested in this. But uh, it wasn't an even-handed distribution of funds. Another part of the readjustment was uh, what was called the 5220 plan. Veterans were paid twenty dollars a week for a year after coming back to protect the labor force. The idea was to give them time to get back into the into jobs and um, to not uh, force them to, uh, to to look for work immediately and so the labor market could absorb their return much more easily <coughs> uh, excuse me um, I don't know how to pause this thing or right? <laughs> you wouldn't have had that in your in your uh, ear but I have to I have to remember it um, I have to remember to look for a pause. 
Um, the National Mental Health Act in 1946 was also another program that was established to, to assist veterans in dealing with the emotional aftermath of the war and of their resettlement uh, crises and those kinds of things. The National Mental Health Act was, um, although not, uh, I think there was a more money put into mental health in the 1960s, but this is one of the things that really sort of got mental health centers going and mental health services funded by the government. Uh, which provided a whole new avenue of employment for social workers that you'll see in a few moments. As far as labor goes, then uh, we we really touched on most of these earlier, but just to kind of mention it again for you, the National Labor Relations Act, which established the right to collective bargaining, and the Fair Labor Standards Act, which established thing like uh, things like the the um, standard work week, the minimum wage, uh, overtime, those kinds of things really set up a lot of improvement for labor during this period of time. Uh, workers really uh, began to get a foothold in terms of uh, some guarantees and assurances of stability. Um, unions really, uh, you know, became a strong force because of this during this period of time uh, as they, as the right to collective bargaining was uh, was assured and all those other kinds of things that we had mentioned earlier was impl were implemented. Um, the government kind of responding to union demands again you know the idea wasn't so much about uh, helping the worker as it was to spread out jobs among a larger number of adult workers as I had mentioned earlier so altogether a new fiscal relationship develops between the federal government and the states as the result of the new deal and a new interpretation of responsibility of the federal government for social welfare was also established if you know for the first time the federal government uh, recognized a responsibility to provide for the welfare of its citizens uh, through through the provision of services when necessary. Um, still, the philosophy of the New Deal uh, focuses on work uh, and direct relief only until the employment until someone can get their own job. Uh, so, uh, nonetheless, uh, the federal government kind of emerges as the prime promoter of social welfare during this era. But, but you understand the underlying philosophies, uh, while government has stepped in now and it has become uh, much more of a, of a force in, in terms of social welfare and providing for the needy and everything like this, the basic philosophy about the worthy and the unworthy poor and about the morality of work, those kinds of things, uh, didn't change through this. As far as the social profession goes, um, well, one thing that Phyllis Day will tell you is the social work profession supported a lot of the pressures against working women, and and um, uh, they they just uh, were not ones that were activists in those eras at all, in that era at all, and and the notion of fees for services that social workers could be paid for what they do by individuals um, began during this period of time, and new domains for their intervention, social work intervention, emerged such as mental health treatment clinics that we had referred to earlier. Uh, working with juvenile delinquents, uh, working in drug abuse treatment, those kinds of things. It was sort of um, a new kind of a of a approach now for their casework was more in terms of um, you know, therapy almost in in many respects. And and uh, uh, Day tells you that you know she sees the profession moving away from the provision of basic social services uh, for needy individuals and more towards working with middle and upper income clients in in a kind of a traditional uh, therapy kind of a setting almost. There was a split in the social work field, and I think this continues along that uh, the lines of the two branches of the social work profession I had referred to earlier, the professional and the social action branches. Um, uh, I believe it was Florence Hollis uh, and a number of, of people of, of similar belief system continued to uh, uh, practice and encourage the use of psychosocial casework. This is, you know, developing a relationship with the client and, and uh, diagnosing that client and setting goals for the client very much on the medical model, um, very much leaning upon Freudian theory. Um, and, uh, you know, personality development, personality theory, ego theory, those kinds of things. So very traditional kind of therapy kind of uh, interventions, beliefs about individuals. Um, the other, the other uh, area, the functionalist field, um, um, Taft and Smalley and other individuals had a belief that uh, casework control clients 
um, that um, it didn't serve them. And so instead of focusing upon uh, the medical model, the use of the medical model, the functionalists really uh, placed an emphasis on the client and the environment. And the efforts were focused on, uh, on uh, well, first of all, uh, working with the client's strengths, not on controlling them by focusing on their weaknesses. Um, and again, to deal with the problems in the environment more than focusing upon the individual um, that was having the issues. And so you can kind of see how this kind of falls, uh, although it's a, a not uh, not the same thing, it still kind of falls under the social action uh, philosophy, this idea of changing the environment rather than changing the client. And so you can kind of see how those two branches emerge again in this era. And uh, there was a, the split in beliefs were eventually um, synthesized through a, a new approach developed by Helen Harris Perlman. I believe she was at Columbia University, um, referred to as a collective pro problem solving. And this placed the focus on the system like the functionalists had. So we still use this person and environment uh, philosophy, but it incorporated what either the casework approach or the uh, person in environment approach. Uh, whichever one was needed basically to help the client so this sort of bridged the gap between the two philosophies Perlman was saying basically that there isn't a need uh, to do one or the other that you can really do both in, in working with a with an individual Phyllis Day is clearly unhappy with the social profession and what happens during this era and she says that uh, this quote in particular I think was very illustrative illust illustrative of, of her beliefs this is the profession of social work had altered nearly completely from the provision of income maintenance for the poor to an accent on mental health for the middle class and social workers had become professionals rather than reform voices crying in the wilderness this uh, uh, I think is she's uh, pretty eloquent when she comes to talk about a number of different uh, groups and it's clear that the how the social work profession develops over the years is not something that she's pleased with either as a social worker herself well uh, apparently okay there <laughs> well, you learn something new every day obviously that concludes this presentation and so uh, with that I'm going to uh, I close this out. Uh, you might look in the learning unit and see if there is a, another uh, another lecture. It will be much shorter to listen to. So um, thanks again for listening, and uh, let me know if you have any questions. I hope this has been helpful for you. Next week we'll talk a little bit about what was going on. Well, actually, in a few weeks we'll talk about what was going on after World War II and, and the developments as the New Deal was implemented and, and uh, our society responded to it. Until then... Um, Take care and uh, hope uh, everything goes well for you. Bye now.